Hello everyone. This is the third lecture in the postgraduate group. The title will be Pediatric Tracheostomy Tricks. It is presented by Dr. Hazem Muhammad Abdul Tawab, Professor and Consultant of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, Cairo University, Egypt. Actually, when we are going to speak about tracheostomy, this is a very common and very well known procedure to all of us in the ENT field. But whenever we are speaking about the pediatric tracheostomy, usually we have many questions to answer. It's related to the indication, might be related to the position, might be related to the complications, might be related to the technique itself. So in my presentation today, I'm going to speak about some tricks that they are related to the pediatric tracheostomy, which might make the, this title or this issue easy to us all. So in order to start, we need to have a look about the history of tracheostomy overall. Tracheostomy is actually a very uh, old procedure. Some literature had mentioned that some drawings had been found in the hieroglyphic culture of ancient Egypt pharaohs, as well as uh, the old India as well. But in our literature, in our new literature, in our recent literature, it is in the 19th century where after Trousseau, it has been found and been used for the upper respiratory tract obstruction created by or caused by diphtheria. This indication had so much decreased later on by the vaccine as well. It has been used for inflammatory conditions such as laryngitis and epiglottitis, but with the strong antibiotics, its use in the laryngitis had decreased a lot and with the evolution of vaccines for epiglottitis, uh, I mean the vaccines for the uh, uh, hemophilus influenza, of course, it has been decreased as well the use of tracheostomy in cases of epiglottitis to very limited cases. However, it is being used till now in some of the congenital malformations. And when I mean that, I mentioned that about the congenital malformations, it will include all the congenital informations, for example, the jaw, the mandible, the tongue, the uh, laryngeal inlet itself, so, more or less, it has been used in the congenital malformations uh, all over its history till now. What is the actual incidence for the pediatric tracheostomy nowadays? It has been found that up to seven children, up to seven cases per 100,000 children or child population, uh, its peak has been found in the first year of life, and this is, could be easily explained by the presence of congenital anomalies in this age group. But we have another peak, actually. This will be in the teenage. And why is that? It can be justified by the uh, high rate of trauma in this group. The teenagers usually have uh, more open for trauma, more than the congenital cases which will appear in the first year of life. So we have two beaks for the tracheostomy in the children. Indications in pediatric population. Before going into the tricks of the technique itself and how to deal with the tracheostomy, we need to know why to do uh, tracheostomy in the pediatric population. So we need to go about the indications. The first one is to relieve the upper airway obstruction which can be caused by inflammations, as we have said, although its use has been diminished a lot, or the congenital malformations of the upper airway. It has been used as well till now for the prolonged intubation cases, and this will be discussed in details after a while. It's to reduce the anatomical dead space, which is actually there is no gas exchange, and in order to, some, in some cases, to decrease this anatomical dead space, where no use or no exchange of gases to help the child to have uh, a well and efficient breathing, uh, tracheostomy also can be used. And finally, the toilet of the airway, which will happen if there are uh, too much secretions in the airway that needs to be cleared. So these are the four main categories of uh, indications in pediatric population. So we are going to take them one by one. For the upper is red tract obstruction, uh, some examples, for example, in the oropharynx and tank base, like macroglossia, treacher, Collins, and golden heart syndrome, these two conditions usually are associated, or syndromes are associated with 
uh, congenital malformations in the jaw and mandible. So uh, it's crucial sometimes uh, to create a tracheostomy for this patient so that he can withstand or just uh, uh, defeat the problem of respiration or difficult breathing. Cystic hygroma as well, because of the swelling, sometimes it can cause pressure uh, on the airway and needs to be uh, overcome by the creation of tracheostomy. So this is one regards to the oropharynx and tongue base. The supraglottis, usually supraglottic cysts, which are most of the time are congenital anomalies, usually the need for tracheostomy is because of the uh, difficult intubation. The glottis, the most common anomaly in the glottis will be the vocal cord palsy. Sometimes the trauma, uh, either physical uh, or chemical. Subglottis, the most common thing and problem in the subglottis will be only the subglottic stenosis and the hemangioma. Hemangioma is a definite, a very definite incidence, uh, sorry, indication for tracheostomy. Because of what? Because you are afraid with the ETT, with the endotracheal intubation, to cause pleading in the airway. So subglottic stenosis and hemangioma, tracheostomy is indicated in the children population. High tracheal stenosis, which is somehow related to the subglottic region as well, and the uh, tracheal rings after that. The second indication, uh, as I have mentioned before, is the prolonged intubation. So if there is a child in the scabu, for example, or in the ICU, and he is intubated, when can I say that this child is in need for tracheostomy? Um, actually, this is also debatable. There are some controversies. Uh, why do we need to put or to create a tracheostomy in such a child? Is to avoid the ulceration, which is caused by the trauma and the ischemic necrosis caused by the trauma related to the endotracheal tube. So we need to remove the endotracheal tube because ulceration and trauma in this region will later on cause stenosis. This stenosis will create a great problem later on. The tracheal stenosis is somehow uh, a problem which is, uh, needs more intervention. So better to overcome that all by creation of tracheostomy. But actually, what is the proper time that we will say that in the child, in this child, I need to create tracheostomy? How long should I wait with the endotracheal tube in that child? Um, it has been said and found in the literature that the premature, premature infants usually tolerate more time because of the nature of the larynx and the soft cartilages. Usually they, uh, they can tolerate the endotracheal tube more than the usual. But what is the average duration? It will be about two to three weeks intubated the child before you think of tracheostomy. So whenever you have a child in the scabu on the ICU with one week uh, duration uh, intubation. Uh, usually this is not found in the literature so much and better to wait uh, for two to three weeks average before thinking of the tracheostomy and doing one. So what are the tricks in the technique? If you see this picture, it will show the position. All of us know the position of the tracheostomy where you can put a towel uh, under the, the shoulder so that you will cause some hyperextension. What is uh, uh, put actually, uh, in addition here, this elastic band. This elastic band is usually to create some extension uh, or more extension in the neck. Actually, this is one of the techniques that I uh, myself I use, uh, putting that elastic band here, but we need to be so careful. Why is that? The position is definitely will be in hyperextended position in that extended position, uh, you put a roll towel uh, under the shoulder so that you will have that extension uh, position. That elastoplast, as I have mentioned, usually I use in my work and in the literature as well, it has been found and used uh, to create that extension, that type of extension you see in the picture, and it will create or, or make your work easy. But in extension, you need to have um, some thinking of two problems. In some children, especially the Down syndrome, uh, they are more liable to have atlantoaxial subluxa subluxation if you do some more extension. So please take a careful history and know your child 
know the child that you are going to do a tracheostomy for. If he's a Down syndrome child, please do not uh, exert or do not lead to or make so more extension. The other thing is that in that position, actually, all the mediastinal structures become high in the lower neck. So it means that you might injure the great vessels, you might injure the pleura easily. Uh, this what makes this position crucial for the surgery, and you need to take it uh, very seriously whenever you are doing the procedure. The issue is with the neck of the child because of the nature of cartilages, the cricoid, the trachea itself, and the larynx, usually it's difficult to find the larynx and to find the trachea so that you will do your tracheostomy. That's why you need the proper position, but please put in consideration these two main problems. You need to work in the center. You need to work uh, just away from the suprasternal notch so that to avoid the great vessels. So one important tip uh, or advice is to take care from excessive dissection. Why? Because the trachea in the child is so near. So going for more dissection, more and more, and you find yourself did not reach the trachea, it means that you have just missed it. So trachea, all the time, you need to feel the tracheostomy, uh, the, sorry, you need to feel the trachea all the time, all the time, every step. Please put your finger and feel the trachea. Put your finger again and feel the trachea because with time, if you just missed it, and you are working so long uh, and excessive dissection is there, it means that you have just missed it and you have gone either to the right, either to the left of the uh, trachea. So this is so much, uh, much important in your work. One more thing is to escalate the chest. Usually I do that in my work. I tell the anesthesia doctor or me myself to hear the uh, chest before the procedure and after the procedure. Why? Sometimes, you will have a child who's actually one of the lungs are not working efficiently like the other. Maybe because of secretions, maybe because of some uh, uh, problem at lectasis or something like that. And then all of a sudden after the operation, because you do not have a, a baseline auscultation before the surgery, uh, you are going to hear after the surgery and then you will find one diminished air entry than the other. Then you will be left in a question. Did I cause a complication? Did you cause a complication in the surgery, like a pneumothorax or something like that? Because there is a diminished uh, air entry. But this should be avoided and could be avoided easily if you have a baseline auscultation before the surgery. So please, before going with your technique, after booting the child, and before the start of the technique, please boot your uh, stethoscope and hear the uh, chest and listen well to the air entry bilateral and record it, you and the anesthesia uh, doctor. This is so much important before going for the technique. So skin incision in uh, overall in tracheostomies, um, we are happy to do the uh, this drawings. This is the horizontal incision. This is actually what we have learned why we were junior doctors, uh, is to create these this thing for the cricoid, I need to know the cricoid, I need to put a mark on the suprasternal notch and I will go in the midline between both and why to do the horizontal incision. It has been mentioned in the literature that this will go in a skin crease, that's why it will not cause an ugly scar. But I need to raise your attention in one thing. Uh, these babies or these children usually will have so long standing tracheostomy. So speaking about the scar, sometimes is, uh, is not logic. Because if doing a horizontal scar or if doing a vertical scar and this child will stay with the tracheostomy for one month, two months, more, usually they are staying more than this, then it means that most of the time you will find a scar. You will find that scar either with the horizontal technique, either with the vertical technique. So it's according to your uh, uh, um, comfort, uh, of course. If you are happy with the horizontal, uh, it's okay, but please don't say because of the scar, because the scar thing will happen in both. It will be less, of course, in the horizontal, but it will happen in both. Why is that? Because of the long-standing tracheostomy, as have been mentioned in the literature, of course. Uh, so vertical uh, incision should be also uh, considered, because with the vertical, you have the advantage of opening in the midline, you are feeling the trachea, you can dissect 
everything in the midline you can see the white line and you can dissect easily bilateral and your uh, incision uh, should not be very big incision so that much scar fear uh, is not actually true as i said the vertical incision is having the many advantages of being easy being rapid it has been mentioned in emergency all of us know that either in child or in an adult it will be like a very rapid and emergency technique that will help you because you are in the midline um, you should remove the subcutaneous fat why is that for example if i open my incision whether it is vertical or horizontal and i find this fat inside why i should remove all the subcutaneous fat i need this skin later on after i remove that fat to be in contact with the tracheal incisions there will be something we are going to call the maturation sutures uh, we are going to mention after a while uh, it means that the skin should be co-opted very near to the trachea uh, booting or leaving this much fat in children will just make the stoma away the tra tracheal stoma will be away from the skin incision which carries actually a very high risk of decannulation so it's actually better during my practice uh, is to remove the uh, subcutaneous fat in every single case uh, this will help you in your technique and will make the complications of decan uh, of uh, this uh, dislodgement of the tracheostomy uh, uh, less dissection okay for this section as you have seen you can use the monopolar technique all of us use you can use the bipolar technique and one thing should i transfix cut and transfix the isthmus or leave it um, okay in adults in adolescents and in older children usually you will need to transfix the isthmus like you are going to open in the midline you are going to dissect uh, the strap muscles you are going to find the isthmus in front of you the thyroid isthmus because you are working actually uh, you are want you want to face the third and fourth trachea rings so you will face the uh, isthmus of the thyroid gland then if your child is an adolescent for example or an older child then you need to cut after you cut just transfix the isthmus to avoid bleeding you need to tie it in order to avoid bleeding but in young children in uh, for example infants usually the cut with bipolar would be enough you are going to cut that the thyroid isthmus and this will be enough and usually no bleeding encountered in such cases so stay on the trachea what does it mean i told you before in the last slide or the previous slides that you need to feel the trachea all the time please boot a finger and feel the trachea every single step you are working sometimes um, we have a big problem this is what most of these children are having also an isogastric tube inserted so whenever you are dissecting here sometimes if you just go right or left of the midline you can feel the nasogastric tube going into the esophagus behind the trachea and then you will have that thing that this is my uh, my aim this is the trachea and this is wrong because you have put a finger on and you felt the nasogastric tube so please stay in the midline all the time feel everything and if it is possible for you or for the treating team to remove the nasogastric tube before the procedure so that it will never be uh, mistaken as the trachea uh, it, this will help you a lot so please stay on the trachea all the time be sure that you are not feeling the nasogastric tube be sure that you are in the midline uh, and feel the trachea all the time so tracheal incision after we have opened uh, the skin after we removed the subcutaneous fat uh, after we dissected the uh, strap muscles in the midline and we have reached it to the trachea usually what's happening is to open the trachea and usually we are cutting the trachea either a superiorly based flab and inferiorly based flab or cut the complete wedge but regarding it children please before opening what you should do is that you are going to open a vertical slit shaped incision so no cut why is that because this is the best incision that will close later on if 
this patient will be weaned or decannulated from the tracheostomy later on. So the best thing is to create only a slit here. So usually it will be in the third to fourth trachea rings to avoid any injury to the cricoids or, and to be away from the uh, roots of the neck where the great vessels and the pleura is there, apex of the lung. So before opening this slit, please take stay sutures. You are going to take non-absorbable sutures, for example, proline, uh, whatever you have. And then you take this incision. You are going to come from here in the tracheal wall itself before incision of the trachea and coming out. So you are going to come inside and then come out. And then after you, you make this one equal, the two, uh, uh, the, this one, this tie equal, please cut the needle. And then do the, the same thing on the other side. And one more thing is to put this one and this one at an equal distance from the midline. Why I should do, uh, do that and why non-absorbable? I should do that before, uh, before creating the stoma. I will use this, these two ones to just elevate the trachea. So I'm just gently elevating the trachea, make it so more superficial. It will help me to open the trachea and later on, of the, if the tracheostomy is dislodged by any means, then uh, the treating team or the pediatricians or you yourself if you are there, you can use these stay sutures to elevate the trachea the same way and you boot your tracheostomy so easy. So you are going to have an unabsorbable suture, as I have said, you pass it and you get it out, equals and you tie them after cutting the needle and uh, we, later on we are going to fix them on the chest. One on the right, one on the left, and we are going to write on them, please do not remove. We are going to write on them the side. This one is right, this one is left, or according to your orientation. Okay, when, after doing this thing, at that time only uh, open the uh, tracheal incision, the vertical slit-shaped incision, as I said, and boot your tracheostomy. Stay sutures will stay till when, till the first change, because Till that time, you need to secure your track, the track of tracheostomy. So better to wait. After that, after you make the first change, then you can remove them and remove the sutures uh, uh, of the tracheostomy, of the stoma skin itself later on, which is usually seven days on the average. Seven, we can say seven to 10 days. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, after you put your uh, stitches, the stay sutures, then you open the slit here between the third and fourth uh, trachea rings in the third and fourth trachea rings. This is the shape and you are going to insert the uh, tracheostomy tube and all of us know the technique itself. Like you are going to tell the anesthetic doctor, the anesthesia doctor, please remove the endotracheal tube gently step by step uh, upwards. And then whenever you see that the tip of the endotracheal tube is out, then you are going to insert the tube. Why to keep the uh, trachea, endotracheal tube inside? Please don't tell the anesthesia doctor to completely remove it. Now, after you boot the, trache the tracheostomy tube, please tell him to listen again to the chest and connect his ventilator and check the capnogram. If everything is okay, then at that time only he can remove the endotracheal tube. But please tell him not to be in a hurry and you should not be in a hurry to remove the endotracheal tube until you completely secure the tracheostomy tube in place. As I mentioned before, slit is better than cut a piece or tracheal flap. This will be better for healing and better if this child is having a chance of decannulation later on, especially in children. So what about the maturation sutures? Uh, the maturation sutures here appear in the uh, red uh, uh, lines. So you are going to use in this one, you're going to use absorbable sutures. What will happen? I told you in the previous slides that you should remove the subcutaneous fat. So the skin incision itself and the tracheal incision will be co-opted together. Then you are going to tie the skin incision, the skin edge, to the tracheal edge. Usually this will help the trachea to be more superficial. And these absorbable sutures later on uh, after absorption, uh, it will just make your work secure and safe and it will make easy uh, introduction of tracheostomy if by any wrong mistake uh, or any wrong instances it uh, just becomes dislodged or you need to change it. Then it will be easy to see your track. So absorbable sutures, the maturation sutures help 
uh, help you and help the tracheostomy to be in a safe uh, place. This is a safe stoma. Again, this should be done before insertion. Do not boot the tracheostomy tube and then you struggle to uh, do the sutures because it will be so difficult to put the needle and get it out between the skin and between the edge and your tracheostomy is there. So please, before insertion, after you just open the vertical slit, Halas, already you have removed the, uh, the subcutaneous fat. Please do the maturation sutures. After that, you insert the tracheostomy tube. One of the problems that we face, what actually the type and what is the size of the tracheostomy tube. In this uh, table or in this uh, 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 easy one, I need you to look at two main uh, columns here. Uh, or actually let, them, let us make them three. The chile and the portex usually are the most used. Uh, and look at the number of ETT. Uh, if you have a child with ETT, for example, 4.5 to 5, the endotracheal tube, then usually the corresponding vortex will be the same, 4.5. But because the shyly is usually different uh, in structure from the vortex, usually this is the corresponding size. So at any time you are going to change the vortex to shyly, please look at the difference. One more thing, uh, if you're going with the numbers, you'll find the 5 is uh, just consistent with the five vortex, but there is difference in the shyly. So whatever the age in this group, from premature to newborn to months, two years as well, till the 14 years uh, old, you can check the ETT size. This is of the average. You can check uh, by that the vortex, which is the most commonly used uh, itself, and the shyly, of course, and notice the difference between them all. So insertion of the tracheostomy tube, after you have inserted the tube, uh, uh, I mentioned that the stay sutures, one will come and you write uh, the side right and do not remove, left and do not remove. And please be sure that it will not be mixed because sometimes with the uh, inexperienced care, usually they mix these sutures. So you'll find the left and the right or the right and the left and this will create, create a trouble if you are going to boot the tracheostomy or change it later on. So please uh, instruct the workers, uh, the health team workers with you who are in the ICU, for example, or the doctors or the staff nurses, uh, to take care all the time from the stay sutures and not to change their position. And I mentioned before that you should not remove these stay sutures till you establish the first change. So before booting the tube, you need to test the tube cuff. If it is cuffed tube, most of the tracheostomy tubes that be being used in children are not cuffed. But if you are going to use a cuffed tube for any problem uh, or for any indication, please test the cuff outside. Check that the cuff is inflating well before booting the tracheostomy inside. Slightly remove the ETT tube, as I said, step by step, and please do not remove it till confirmation that your tracheostomy is inside and the anesthesia doctor have mentioned that the chest uh, entry is okay for him and the capnogram also confirmed the, uh, that everything is well. Uh, tapes on the chest, you need to put these tapes and write on them right and left and please do not remove. Now we are going to secure the tube around the neck. Should I tie the tube the tracheostomy itself, the tracheostomy tube, these flanks, should I tie them to the skin, suture them to the skin, or only uh, wrapping around the neck would be enough. So one important tip that you need to know, or advice that you need to know is better not to just put stitches uh, on the skin unless they are so tight, because the problem is that the children's uh, skin uh, is so pliable. So it's easy to uh, give you a false impression that you have secured your tracheostomy to the skin, but it will just cause some, because of the elasticity, it can move uh, out, leading to dislodgement of the tracheostomy tube. So better to have this uh, tie, usually it is supplied with the tracheostomy, around the neck, and you need to insert a finger so that it will not cause uh, tight pressure. So one finger usually is enough, and you need to tie on that. Uh, so sometimes in our work, we are not using the tape only. Usually we are getting one endotracheal tube. We, we are cutting the endotracheal tube and wrap it around the neck 
not a full circle, of course, I mean, uh, but like a C-shaped uh, behind the neck. And pass this tape inside it. So the tape will not be directly on the uh, skin. Uh, the endotracheal tube, because it is softer on the skin, it will be uh, uh, all around from behind, but not like a complete circle. It will be a C-shaped from behind. And you put your tape, this tape inside it, and then uh, the end of the endotracheal tube will be here. The end, the other end will be here. And uh, the tie will be just out to get in the uh, flank of the tracheostomy tube. And you definitely put a finger so that it will be easy and maintain the tracheostomy tube in place. Uh, one important question, one important trick. Should I do that in the flexed position or in the extended position we are working in? Please do it in the flexed position. This is the end position. Sometimes if you are going to do the uh, this wrapping and this fixing around the neck while it is extended, it becomes loose when you return to the normal position. So please return the head to normal position slight uh, flex or in the neutral position, you should tie around the neck. Okay, sutures to the skin. I mentioned you can do that as double security and safety, but please do not depend on them alone because the skin of the uh, children usually is pliable, elastic, and can lead to dislodgement later on. So better to do the rubbing around the neck as I mentioned. Early care. This is a very important tip. After the surgery, I need to check if there are secretions. I need to suck, uh, suck them out. This is why, because I said before that one of the most important indications is the oral toilet. So what should I do? Before starting the procedure, get your tracheostomy tube. For example, if the tracheostomy tube is 3.5, use a catheter 7. If it is 4 size, use a catheter uh, suction catheter 8. So it is usually double size the tracheostomy size. So if you have a tracheostomy tube size 4, please prepare the suction catheter uh, size 8. And then what you will do? You will just pass it and only half centimeter, half centimeter only from the tip. You, because after you insert the tracheostomy tube, we don't want the, the suction catheter to cause injury of the trachea. If you go down far, you can injure the carina, you can injure the tracheal wall itself. So please uh, just do that measure of the, uh, of the suction catheter till it becomes out by half centimeter and you just memorize what was the number here. Because later on, you are going to look at that number. You know that it is only half centimeter out of the tracheostomy tube inside the trachea, so it will not cause injury due to your manipulations inside the trachea. This action actually needs uh, trained personnel later on in the ICU, for example, or in the SCABU unit, because sometimes we're, we're, we're untrained persons or unexperienced persons, they can put the full uh, suction catheter inside and just do more suction, suction, and more suction. This will create more injury. Usually the suction is needed in the first day, uh, but it will become less with clearance of secretions inside the trachea and lungs. Usually, if there are some blocked secretions, usually you use the 0.9% saline. When I should do the first tube change? Average of one week to 10 days, better to be one week. Start first with the same size. Remember that you have done the stay sutures so they can help you to boot the uh, tracheostomy change. If it is okay and you want to remove the stay sutures at that time, uh, feel convenient and safe. But after insertion of the new tracheostomy tube, sometimes if you find a difficulty in booting the same size, please boot a smaller size by uh, half a degree measure. Or you can use the Seldinger technique where you can boot a tracheostomy, uh, sorry, a suction catheter, and you can insert it, uh, the inserted tracheostomy tube on it like putting the suction catheter in the stoma of the trachea, and then you gently slide the tracheostomy tube along the suction catheter till it comes into the stoma and comes in its place, and then you remove the suction catheter. Okay, pediatric tracheostomy red flags, when I should be worried. So there are actually four 
categories of flaps uh, of uh, red flags. The first one is the airway red flags. If you find that a child, your child is suddenly started or able to talk, or you can hear audible air leaks or bubbles, it means that the tracheostomy has a problem. If you put a suction catheter and it's not passing, it means that usually there are some blocked secretions or maybe it has been dislodged. If you feel that your child or that child is having stridor and difficult breathing, so it means that this tracheostomy is having a problem. What about the breathing red flags? If that child developed apnea, or if there is increased ventilator support, or if there is increased oxygen requirements uh, in the ICU or is kapu, you mean uh, you should think that the tracheostomy is having a problem, maybe dislodged, maybe some secretions uh, blocked them. Uh, if you can see the accessory muscle use, if you can see the increased respiratory rates, if you can see the high pressures of the airway and the lower tidal volumes, it means that that child is in respiratory distress. If you please listen to the noisy breathing and you find it, it means that the tracheostomy is in uh, a wrong position or there is a problem with it. Tracheostomy itself related red flags. Like, for example, if it is visibly displaced, you can look to the neck and you can see that the tracheostomy is not in place and it's out. Then you need to manage that uh, accordingly, according to your situation, or just come back with a Sildinger technique or decreasing the size of the tube, as I said, or maybe we can come back again to the ETT uh, with the pediatrician, a pediatric ICU doctor, uh, if you find difficulty in inserting the tracheostomy again. If you find also bleeds around the tracheostomy, then it means that mostly it is dislodged if there is no infection at that time. The last group of uh, general red flags is definitely related to the respiratory rates, respiratory, related to the heart rate. If you find a high respiratory rate or uh, heart rate, it means that there is a problem, definitely. There is a stress. The level of consciousness is so much important, but you should never wait till you see that that child is having a difficulty with the level of consciousness or having restlessness because your work uh, should come whenever you think. If you think that there is a need for tracheostomy, you should do the tracheostomy. If you think that there is a problem with that tracheostomy, you should manage by changing the tracheostomy immediately. Actually, this was the first lecture related to the tracheostomy in pediatric, pediatric age group. Uh, I hope finally that uh, this item is so clear to all of you. And uh, thank you so much.